Good morning. My name is Ray Hughes, and I'm the interviewer for the Veterans History Project out of Washington, D.C., and conducted through the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library, located in Cincinnati, Ohio. The head of that program is Brian Powers, who is the cameraman here today. And today is the 20th day of June, 2016. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing World War II veteran Louis Dean Giacometti. 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 And it's Thank a pleasure you. to meet you, sir. Pleasure to meet you. And uh, all right to call you Dean? That's what everybody calls me. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, Dean, if you would then, uh, when were you born and where were you born? I was born January 27th in Jackson Center, Pennsylvania. Uh, that was a little community in the coal fields where my father worked. And uh, I was born there January 27th, 1920. And uh, that whole, my whole life changed right there. First of all, my father delivered me. I weighed 12 pounds, he delivered me. Then the doctor showed up, you know, and whatever happened, you know, then he left. And uh, after he had a couple of glasses of wine, he left and he forgot his medical bag. So he came back to get his medical bag and maybe that's why he forgot to make a birth certificate for me. Uh, but some said, well, uh, call the uh, uh, downtown uh, where they store birth certificates, you know, but they never had a record for me. But anyway, uh, my whole life changed right there, not having that birth certificate. But then from there, uh, my dad continued working in the mines and he ended up in Bel Air, Ohio, in Eastern Ohio, where uh, I went to high school. And uh, my well, dad worked in a steel mill there and so did my brother. And where, and where? Bel Air, Ohio, Bel -Air. across the river from uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. From Wheeling. Yeah. And where, uh, were, where were your parents from and what were their names? Uh, my dad's name was Louis, and my mom's name was Josephine. And uh, what was her maiden name? Malga Raleigh, M A L G O R O L I, Malga Raleigh. She too is from northern Italy. Where were they from in Italy? Uh, a little town that I don't know the name of anymore, about 15 miles south of Switzerland, and maybe 20 miles east of uh, France uh, in that area. But before coming over here, my dad went to, uh, what's that little, Lux Luxembourg, and worked in a iron mine uh, in Luxembourg, that, not a slope mine, the one that goes straight down. And, you know, he worked there for a couple of years. And, oh, by the way, when my dad was 14 years old, they sent him, or he went to Argentina. Uh, he worked there for four years picking potatoes, then came back to Italy and did his, two years service in the army and somewhere met mom and they got married and the next thing you know uh, they're on the ship coming over here and it took them six weeks on that boat. What year did they come here? 1906. Uh, that ship stopped in southern France, Spain, England loaded up and it took them six weeks to get over here. Where'd they land at? Uh, New York City. And, and uh, my uh, mom had a uh, uh, premature birth on the way over and lost a, a child, you know. Can you imagine what it was like in those days? Holy smokes. But my dad's first job was uh, working uh, in, underneath the uh, uh, Hudson River in New York. Is that right? Yeah, because see, they found out that he had experience working down underground, see. So he worked under there for I don't know how long. Is that a sand hog? Pardon? Was that a sand hog? Well, I guess you could call it that, I, I guess. That's... But then from there, they ended up in eastern uh, or western Pennsylvania in the coal fields. Did they go through Ellis Island when they came here? I'm sure they did, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I got a, a granddaughter who lives on Long Island and, and two great grandchildren there. And uh, I got, darn it, uh, I got up there a couple of times and I wanted to go check it on Ellis Island where they have those, you know, but yeah. I never have done it. Yeah. I'm going to get my granddaughter to go over there. She can do that. Yeah. Uh, so your dad came to uh, from New York. He came uh, working in the Hudson. Yeah, underneath the Hudson River, River. for uh, some tunnel. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the tunnel, yeah. but. Uh, and then he, how long did he do that? 
I, I, I'm guessing six or seven months. And then came to Ohio? No, no, Western Pennsylvania. What county was that that you went to in Pennsylvania? Do you remember? I used to know the town Jackson Center I don't think exists anymore. Place about 40, 50 miles north of Pittsburgh. That's all north. I know. Okay. Yeah. North of Pittsburgh and uh, maybe 40, 30 miles east of Youngstown, Ohio. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yes, that while there, he went to Piney Fork, Ohio, and worked in the coal mines, then went back to Jackson Center, Pennsylvania, then came down to Bel Air, Ohio. And uh, he had some great tragedies there. A drunken driver who is a well-known person in the community because of his wealth. While very intoxicated, he was going south on the street, cut all the way over across the other lane and hit my two sisters head on. One was killed instantly. The other one died seven months later. Can you imagine losing two like that? Yeah. And a guy never spent one minute in jail because he had a lot of money. They had a trial and everybody in, in town knew that wasn't fair, you know, yeah. but we had to live with that. I, I grew up seeing pictures on the wall of my sisters in coffins, you know, and I remember during that time, I was, I was very young, so I was sleeping downstairs with my parents, and I wake up in the morning, I'd look in there in the front room, and there was a coffin. See, in those days, they brought the coffin home <clears throat> for three days, see, so that happened twice in a seven-month period. And to this day, I hate that smell of those artificial flowers. Yes, yes. yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, my dad uh, and mom, oh, how they suffered over that. Oh, gosh sakes. And uh, you know, hey, when you're an immigrant like that and you have this happen, you don't have a burial place, so I had to buy a, a lot in the cemetery, Rose Hill Cemetery, bury the first one, uh, bury the second one. Uh, imagine the cost you know, and he, with no money. And you know what, three, four years later, he didn't like him being on this side of the cemetery. He paid to have the bodies removed and put them on this side, overlooking the Ohio River in West Virginia. But anyway, uh, that's, they had a tough life, but I had the greatest parents in the world. What other uh, brothers and sisters did you have? Then? Well, I had my brother Ben, the one I showed you the picture. Ben was eight years older than I and he worked in a steel mill, and he, got a, he left high school, he was about 15 years old in just the seventh grade. And as I said, they thought he was just a, uh, a slow learner, you know, but as we found out, uh, he had that... Uh, dyslexia. What, dyslexia, and as I told you, I discovered he had dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And after that, Ben was a little different kind of a guy, but uh, with dyslexia, going in the Marine Corps, and in seven months you're a sergeant, and you end up a staff sergeant, that takes some doing. That sure does. And you know the story. I run him down on Okinawa. Yeah. But when, when we landed in this, uh, it was called a Purple Project. They threw something together. The war was getting close to an end, and I knew it was going to Okinawa. The reason I knew, my mom wrote to me and said she hadn't heard from Ben in 11 months. So I contacted the Red Cross and they tracked him down. And uh, so my mom wrote and told me, well, he's on Okinawa. Oh, I knew that. See, so I get to Guam. I call a hospital in Guam. I said, may I speak with Benny Giacometti? They said, he's been discharged. Well, I, I asked a dumb question. Where did you send him? Oh, we can't tell you. I knew that. And I knew they sent him back to Oki, you know. So when we got up to Okinawa, did our things, unloaded here and there, and as soon as I got a chance, 45 minutes, I'm talking to him. Is that right? Yeah. I was on this side of uh, the ocean, and he was on the other side. It's only about three miles across the Okinawa. I walked in the first sergeant's tent. He said, you're Big Jack's brother. See, those guys had been together for about three years. They know more about each other than you know about your wife, you know? Yeah. So, uh, oh boy, oh boy. I said, well, I'm going to go down real carefully and not surprise Ben, you know. And I hadn't seen him in three years now. 
I got excited and I just literally jumped in from the other and then oh, 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 oh. He had a letter in his pocket that I had written to him about me getting married, see. But oh, then while we were there, the war officially ended. Did we have a time? Uh, my brother traded a jeep, a military jeep, for three cases of beer. <laughs> see, these sailor guys had a lot of stuff like that because they're shipped right there, you know. Boy, there, and, and I run into three, four other fellows from Bel Air, and we're riding in a jeep, about four of us, you know, drinking a beer and throwing a bottle. Boy, those soldiers, where'd you get that beer? Where'd you get that? <laughs> we didn't tell them. But anyway, uh, that's, that was quite an experience. And uh, uh, then uh, we started home. Uh, believe it or not, I got this, no, I, could, I got to the United States before my brother, but uh, he got discharged before I did. Okay, let me interrupt you just one second. Please do. I wanted to hear that story, but uh, let's go back now. We're at Bel Air and you're going to school. You have, you, what grade school did you go to? Uh, first ward school in South Bel Air, two years, then Rose Hill School, uh, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Then everybody in Bel Air went to Central High School for the seventh and eighth grade. Then uh, right, right attached to that school was Bel Air High School. Uh, I, and uh, I went there for the next four years. Did you play sports uh, in those years? My, uh, as a freshman, I weighed 89 pounds. I lived in the dream of playing football, any athlete, because I, I could run, I could do it all. I even was a pretty good fighter. Finally, as a senior, I weighed 140 pounds. So this hot August night, we're sitting under the street lamp. To the left is the great Nick Scorich, captain of the UC team in 1942. Play, later on, head coach of the Cleveland Browns, head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. What was his name again? S-K-O-R-I-C-H, Scorich. Uh, he and I were on the same street in Bel Air. Mm -hmm. And oh. you, you heard this one. I, I used to say to my friend, you, you like Nick better than you like me. <laughs> well, anyway, then on this side was Samuel de Blasis, another teammate, who became one of the most powerful uh, politicians uh, and lawyers in the state of Maryland. He's one of these guys that uh, could make you a governor, you know. He, and you say, Dean, if I was born in this country, I'd be president of the United States. Uh, he never wanted a political job because it, he was making so much money. But you know what? He ended up a judge, and I watched him in a courtroom, and I couldn't help from smiling because he was a pretty bad kid back in Bel Air, you know. Uh, then uh, he, he was eventually attorney general of the 6th Federal District of Maryland. Isn't that something? Yeah. They're both on the east side of me. So they said, Dean, you've got to go out for football this year. Uh, you know, we're senior this and that. And I said, guys, I'd, I'll be embarrassed because they won't give me a uniform. I'm too small. They said, what we'll do is, I'll, Nick says, I'll stand in front of you. And Sam says, I'll stand behind you. They were lettermen, say. And we'll tell a coach, you know, all this stuff, you know. And Frank over here was the manager. He says, Dean, I'll give you equipment to put on so you'll look bigger. See, you had to go up there in shorts or nude, see. So I came up there and there's big sleepy Glenn. What's your name? Mm, Dean Giacometti, you know. Uh, how much you weigh? 155 pounds. He probably knew I was lying, but well, he, says, he probably said I'll get rid of him, which he tried to do. So I got a uniform. Went out for the team and uh, for the first three, four days, he was trying to get rid of me and others, you know. Butch Doty was the biggest guy on our team, 19 years old, 200 pounds. He put him there about 10 yards from me and me standing here and a dummy over there and dummy over there, and he was to run at me full speed. Now, if I'd have flinched, I'd have been gone, see. Here comes Butch Doty, and I chopped him down, down here. Hell, I knew about that, you know. Tried it again, you know, about three times. Uh, then, okay, you know. 
Then we're having a uh, scrimmage, uh, not a live scrimmage, but uh, uh, a, a skill scrimmage. And I was playing left guard. No, I was playing halfback, you know. So I get the ball and I'm running like hell. I came back and he chewed me out. He says, don't pass the interference. You're running too fast there. I said, oh my God, am I gonna play football and run half speed while those 11 guys over there are trying to get me? He said, get up there and left guard. That's how I ended up at left guard. So that's where I played. I and uh, I managed to uh, uh, block two kicks, two punts, then he loved me. And we played our arch rival, Martinsville, Ohio, the home of the, of the brothers. Uh, uh, oh gosh, the one that was a great field goal kicker. Uh, three or three, anyway, uh, I saved the game in that one. I caught a guy out in the open, he's going for a touchdown. <clears throat> but anyway, that's how I played in my senior year. And, what, and you graduated what year? Uh, 1938. 1938. <coughs> now, um, I don't want to jump ahead, but had you met your wife yet? No. Okay. So, in 1938, what are you going to do with your life after you graduate from high school? Well, I got a football scholarship offer at University of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, one of the coaches was from my hometown. I lived on the street. So uh, that was a big mistake, but I went down there. And uh, our training camp was up in the mountains down there, uh, former CCC barracks, you know. So I stayed down there a, a semester, uh, and uh, I was getting knocked around. I wasn't very big, you know, but they kept me. But I finally had to miss about three weeks of school because of my bad grown tonsils, you know. So they suggested, and I'd lost about 10 pounds. So they suggested I go home and uh, rest and fatten up and come back next year. Well, in the meantime, I got a scholarship offer from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, and Nick Scorch, we, we had said, no matter where, we're both gonna go to college together. And we did. Nick could have gone to Alabama, uh, any school in the country, but he chose to come down here. That's how I ended up down here. I see. And uh, so you came here in what year? 1939. 1939. Uh, before I get into your college, uh, you brought up an interesting, did you, did you or anyone in your family work under the three C's? No. No? You no. You didn't have to do anything like that? No. Okay. Uh -uh. So when you came to Cincinnati on your football scholarship, it's in your freshman year. Yes. Yeah. And you're going to play football for UC? Yes. Mm -hmm. And where are you going to live at while you're at UC? In a dormitory. Oh, in a dormitory. Yeah, we lived in a dormitory, room 109, first floor. <laughs> 109F, uh, first floor. Yeah, it was right across from the old gym at UC. It's no longer a dormitory, but that's where we lived. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. And you live with who? Nick Scorch. Yes, we were roommates for yeah. three years. For yes. three years. Mm -hmm. And what were you going to major in while you're at uh, teaching? Uh, teaching. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. I ended up uh, uh, with a history major, ah. uh, teaching. Uh, but you know, well, we'll get to that uh, yeah. uh, after the war. I had to come back to UC and go to school eleven consecutive, uh, twelve consecutive months to get, finish my degree, because I lost a semester when I went in and had to do my senior year. Um, so you were at UC at 1939, 1940, and 1941. Are you there on Pearl Harbor Day, December the 7th, 1941? Was that December? No, I was sitting in my room 109 writing a book report. Uh -huh. I'll be honest, I was copying some girl's book report. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell you the truth. That's right. But yes. And I said, oh my God. I it, the radio off. was on? Yes. Yeah. yeah, this radio, we didn't buy it. We didn't steal it. Okay. But uh, we had this little old radio that Bob Meyer wanted to get rid of, and boy, we took that, you know. Speaking of that, my roommate, Nick Scorch, we were working for the NYA, $15 a month, cleaning the stadium and carrying uh, dead bodies up What's the NYA? Uh, National Youth. What's the last letter? A. National Youth. 
committee or national youth something. Uh -huh. You work. You worked uh, uh, for I forget how many days or hours a, a month, and you got a check for fifteen dollars from the government. What did you do for the NY? Clean the stadium, things like that. Sometime they took you over to medical college, and you had to carry dead bodies in the coffin or something. You know that stuff like that you know oh, clean up around the campus and we didn't work too much but yeah. fifteen dollars was a big help nick scorich i saw him do this he got his fifteen dollars and he took a five dollar bill and put it in the envelope and mailed it to his mother see his dad was a disabled coal miner uh, and nick was one of nine children wow uh but uh yeah, so I saw him do that, and uh, but that's the way things went. Uh, did you play football while you were at UC? In what position did you? I was an end. Uh, and the, on the freshman team, we played four games. I played every minute of four games as a, as a defensive lineman. Then in my sophomore year, they switched me to end. Uh, I, I wasn't a starter, but I played in every game but one in my sophomore year, and then. I got to tell you this, in the spring practice of 1941, I made a beautiful head-on tackle on, on uh, uh, Jerry Swartz, and somebody come up from back and hit me there. Honest to gosh, I heard the crack. I ended up with a trimolar fracture, a dislocated ankle, broken in three places. Oh my God. I actually was laying down, see that toe? It was pointing north or east. I was laying there and I looked down and I saw a white bone. Oh, and Donnie God. Davis come over and started picking me up. I said, no, Donnie, no, no, no. Was, you know. Some guys had come over and looked and they, Coach Meyer came over, he took one look and so pretty soon the paddy wagon came and I go to Christ Hospital and I kept saying, how in the hell are they going to get my shoe off and this uniform off? Well, hell, that was easy. You cut it off, you know. Yeah. I'll never forget the next morning. I wake up, I look down, and I see both toes pointing up in the air. I was told I may have to use crutches the rest of my life or a cane. I certainly would never be able to play football anymore. Uh, I tried. Uh, I got a little better, and I went out for the team the following uh, spring, but I didn't do any live tackling or anything uh, because I wasn't ready for it, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh, by the way, when I went in the military, our team doctor was Dr. Edgar White. He was head of the uh, orthopedic department at the University of Cincinnati, Ed White. And he knew all about this, you know. And after the war, I went to him for my military back, you know, and we'd talk about it. He'd say, hey, everybody come in here, come in here, come in here. Dean, I'm going to take an X-ray of this leg. I'm not going to charge anything. And he'd <laughs> take an X-ray and show them. He says, believe it or not, this is what happened to him, and look at him, you know. So, But anyway, I still got in the Army with it, though. Yeah. They but, gave me a letter, you know, but I didn't show it to anybody. Uh, hell is far. You, uh, uh, you heard the uh, announcement where the Japanese had attacked us at Pearl Harbor. What did you do then? Did you go down and join the service, or what was your next steps? Well, I, you know, I just waited to see what happened. Uh, uh, I knew that uh, my buddies from back home were being drafted, you know, and uh, we all thought the same thing. Maybe they'll let us finish college, you know, or whatever. But uh, I got the letter, you know. Draft notice? Draft notice. And uh, and I, I entered a service, I think, in uh, February, uh, March or April the 25th. And, uh, of 42. Of 42. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget saying goodbye to those guys. But, it, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, I go home and I go downtown to the draft board and report, you know, and two buses took us out to Columbus, Fort Hayes. Like I said, and I got to tell you this, 
After I'm out here about four months, I finally get shipping orders. They put me on that train. The train goes down to Cincinnati. I could look up and see Hughes High School. And boy, and I said, oh God, all my buddies are up there and I'm going, I don't know where. And I ended up on, in Keesler Field. And I'll never forget this moment. I'm down there in Keesler Field, cleaning up, throwing this, all that. And here, and we put up a tent right here, you know. And I, oh my God, they were, we're out doing, uh, oh, oh yeah, some sergeant was marching us left, right, and all that. And we're all standing there like this. And I'm going like this, boy, that's the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, look at the water, I'm saying to myself, you know. He came up and he put his face out for me. He said, you stand still and don't move your head or I'll pull your arm out of the socket and hit you overhead with it. I said, oh, there's never a guy I wanted to punch and kick the crap out of as I could him, you know. But he was told to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But that was, that was interesting. But going on that train past in Cincinnati, past UC, boy, that was something else. So this is, this is you joined on April the twenty fifth, nineteen forty two, and you're. What did you do? Stay up in Columbus for about two, uh, uh, some time, or yeah, I was up there. I think four weeks. Four Fort weeks. Hayes, yes. And the mm -hmm. first at Fort Hayes. Mm hmm. And so you're in the Army now. Air Corps. Oh, Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. Okay, you went in the Army Air Corps right away then. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and from there you go to Keesler, mm -hmm. down, and Keesler is down in Mississippi, if I yes. remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And how long are you at Keesler? Uh, I want to say at the most three, four weeks. And you're doing nothing but basic training, marching and things? Yeah, like stuff like that, you know. Uh, uh, oh boy, that was tough down Did there. Did they know you had three years of college while you were there? Uh, I've heard that so many times in the service, so many times. Uh, hell no, they didn't know. I was just one of all the guys, you know. Okay. Uh, finally, they put us on a train. We didn't know where we were going. We get to Atlanta, Georgia. Train stops. Conductor says, "We're we're gonna we're stopped for 20 minutes. You can get off and do whatever you want, but you know, don't go away. Whatever, whatever." I get off and I see the. The, the uh, major, Christ, I thought he was a king, you know, major, you know. Right. He was what they call the troop commander or something, you know. And the guy that works in the uh, train, little train station come out and they start talking. Sir, how long do you think this war is going to last? And the major said, oh, at least 20 years. I heard that. Oh, my gosh. Oh man, to hear that, you know, I thought, well, this guy really knows, see. But we ended up in Lindbergh Field in Long Island and, uh, well, I, I knew it wasn't going to last 20 years. After two or three years, I knew that, see. But yeah. boy, for a while, I thought it was going to last 20 years. <laughs> Scare you a little bit. Mm -hmm. You, uh, what'd you do at Lindbergh Field? Went to school there uh, uh, to learn airplane maintenance. And uh, I, we went to school six days a week, eight hours a day. Uh, one week from, uh, we got up at six in the morning and had breakfast and went to class, I think, till two o'clock. Then the next week, we went to uh, uh, school from uh, two o'clock till 10 o'clock in the evening. So we did that for six months. Six months? Yeah. Yeah. Close to, no, I, I would say maybe four months. Now you're learning maintenance on what, aircraft engines? Or, yes, uh, yeah. yeah. One week would be on propellers. Another week would be on carburetors. Another week would be on uh, uh, engine this. Every week was something different. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of the way it went. And uh, uh, so from there, uh, and I, I didn't grade too well. <laughs> I didn't do to a, I wasn't interested at all. God damn, I wasn't interested in mechanics. <laughs> and all that, yeah, I never touched an engine after that. Every time we'd go to one of these air bases, we'd go in a, uh, into the air uh, garage, you know, it wasn't called a garage, but you know, and everybody would grab wrenches and doing this and that. And I'd go in and I'd always end up behind the counter giving out parts, see? But that wasn't simple. 
right. the airplane, there were like at least 5,000 parts. You had a book this big, and a guy come in and says, uh, I need this and this and that. I said, well, let's look it up, you know. Right. And you'd open that book, and it was divided. Uh, so many chapters on engine, propeller, and all that. Right. That narrowed it down, down, down. And then when we found it, it had a number. That's what you needed. With that number, uh, I sent down to the warehouse, and the woman there behind the counter gave him a package with a, a carburetor in it. Uh, and took it up. That's, a, that's what I, I loved doing that. Yeah. I liked it, see. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to be out there and be a grease monkey, hell's fire. It just never did appeal to me. Where did you go from uh, Lindbergh Field then? Oh, uh, about 30 miles uh, out further on Long Island to Farmingdale, Long Island, Republic P47 factory there. They were uh, producing the P-47, which uh, ended up being our fastest plane. It was the first one with a four-bladed propeller. Uh, it had uh, eight 50 caliber machine guns, uh, uh, and it had a lot of other firsts. It was the only plane, the first plane that could fly straight up like this, you know. And, oh, and it had a, uh, what is that thing they have in a motor? You press it for about 10 seconds. It, you had, uh, the thrust. Um, uh, there's right. a name for that. Yeah, I know. And I just now hit a mental latch too. But uh, yeah, uh, it was the first airplane that had that. And uh, see, that's if, you know, let's say three or four enemy planes are on your tail and you want to get away. Well, you press this and, for, you know, you'd go up to 450 miles an hour for about 10, 15 seconds. Right. But you couldn't use it again. It was only good for one shot, see. And I was saw that a water injector? No, that's not it. It did inject, not water, but, uh, you know, I try to remember that because I said, I'm going to tell them about that and I've got to remember this. But I I've heard of it, but I've got yeah. a mental latch too. I can't yeah. think of what it is. But, uh, uh, fuel injection, well, something like that. But that's what I did there. Uh, then from there, as I said, I went down to Warner Field and do anything, kitchen duty. Waiting around, waiting around, you know. No, at this time, does anybody yet realize you've got three years of college? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. And you're a private still? Oh. I'll have to tell you. You know what? <clears throat> My outfit, not an outfit, a bunch of us, we ended up at Augusta, Georgia, which is a military police station. I'll never forget it. The guy in front of me was tall, big, you know, and they, the couple of officers over there. And then, and then I weighed 185. I was pretty, you know, and he says, boy, we're getting some good looking guys here. Look, look at this one. Look at this one, you know. I said, what the hell? I, I didn't really give it a thought about being a military police. I would have hated that worse, you know. But anyway, that was a mistake. Then from there, uh, we went back to uh, Warner Robins in Atlanta, and I told you all about that, you know. Now, nobody ever knew I had three years of college. Hmm. If they, I bet a lot of guys said, uh, hey, Dean, how come you're still a private? Uh, you got three years of college. I said, well, I don't know. Uh, that's the way it was, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, Well, go ahead. Um, I think you just said you were at Atlanta then? Yes. What would you do then in Atlanta? Not much, but I watched guys put gasoline in a tank, and uh, there'd be like 50 of us there where five guys could do the job, so we didn't do anything. But there was a B-10 bomber built in 1935. The B-10, yeah. And a couple of pilots would take it up and practice landing in that. And they needed guys as lookouts because this busy airport, you know. And I went on it. I, I don't know if I was ordered to go or not, but I ended up on that plane. And we must have made 15 landings and take off in that damn old plane. And when I think back, imagine us looking out to see if there's another plane coming <laughs> and this old tanker off and on the ground, you know. It was obsolete then. She was, yes, as I think back. But I had a great experience after that. Get a notice. Uh, I'm going to 
to Billy Mitchell Field in Milwaukee. Get on the train, and I always look for a nice looking girl, and then it would sit here, and she's over there, you know. So I found one. Oh, pretty soon we're sitting together, you know, and mm, 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 mm. And I told her where I was going. I was going to get off at the University of Cincinnati because they were playing a night game on Saturday night, and they didn't know I was coming, except my buddy Nick Scorch knew I was coming, you know. And so we talked and talked, and that's one of the biggest decisions I ever had to make because she says, why don't you spend a night with me in Dayton? Wow. So then I'm thinking, do I get off here or do I? Mm. Well, I got off there. Where? But I promised that I would meet her later in Dayton. I got off downtown Cincinnati, took a bus downtown, took a bus up to mm -hmm. UC, barracks bag. I'm walking down Jim Drive. You'll never believe it, what, how this was. I walked in the dressing room. Hey, oh my God. See, none of them had gone this, I was the only one, see? And uh, I'd already been in the military, what, eight, nine, ten months, you know? Oh, the coach came over and gave me a big hug and all this and that, you know, and got it. Oh, never forget it. So they said, the uh, coach said, Dean, why don't you go to the field before the game, you know, in the flip of the coin? So I went out there, you know, and I said, Coach, what do you want, heads or tails? Uh, you know, just joking, of course, but whatever. So the first half, I sat on the bench with the players, the first half, you know. Then at halftime, we go into the dressing room, and I went up to Coach right away. I says, Coach, I'm going to leave right now. I don't want to disrupt anything. I can't tell you how I love this. He put his arms around me. He said, Dean, please come back after the war, whatever. And I said, wait, all the guys, so long, bye, bye, bye. Walking up that gym drive, 10 o'clock at night, with all my friends back there, and I didn't know where I was going. Billy Mitchell Field was a uh, place where they, from there they send you overseas, you know. So boy, that was something. So I rode the, uh, the train all the way to Milwaukee. And when we passed Dayton, I thought about her, see. <laughs> But I got to Billy Mitchell Field and met a nice girl up there, and she was she was wonderful. Her father was a uh, uh, animal doctor. What do you call him? Vet. Veterinary. He was a veteran. Yes. Veterinarian. Uh, yeah. But, what uh, was her name? Or what is her name? I don't remember her oh, name. Oh. Uh, her older sister went to University of uh, Wisconsin. I remember that. Her older sister was better looking. See. <laughs> You know, one experience I had, you know, I was always was a geography buff, you know, I look at maps, I know every river, this, that. So we go down, it's 90 some degrees, see, so we're going to go swimming in Lake Michigan. So we go down there, she takes me down there. So there was a place maybe that high above the water, you know, and I says, are you sure that's deep enough out there? Oh, yes, oh, yes, you know. I dove in the water. That water was so cold. After the first six inches, wow! I never forgot that. Boy, oh boy, I come up with, whew, that was an experience. But uh, I kind of enjoyed Milwaukee. What were you doing at Billy Mitchell Field? Not much, just waiting around. Uh, no mechanical work or anything? No, nah, oh. no, nah, waiting around. Uh, it was a staging area, as I said, you know. I had a great buddy from New York City, Harry Goldberg, and he came, he had a brother that was a doctor in his service, and, and Harry and I got to be pretty close because he was very, very forward, and uh, uh, he wasn't shy at all, see. And he came to me, and I heard the major call, he said to the ma the major said to him, you New York Jew bastard, uh, I'm going to send you so goddamn far in Alaska they're never going to find you. And a lot of other uh, expletives. Right. So Harry told me about it, and I said, gee whiz, Harry, what did you do? Uh, I don't know, really don't know to this day what he did, see, but uh, Harry goes up to the planning, or where they, in the office, you know, in another building looks around, he sees a guy, 
He happened to be from New York City and a friend. So he told him. Uh, he scratched him off. He said, I'm going to send you to Wilmington, Delaware, Newcastle Iron Air Base. That's close to New York City, see? So he came back. He said, Dean, you want to go with me? Make a long story short, I went with him. But before that, we went to his house in New York City. And it was a Jewish holiday. And I remember they asked me to light a candle. I wondered why they asked me. Later on, I found out that was part of their religion, you know. So I spent uh, a day or two there, uh, day and night. Then I went, uh, we both went down to <clears throat> Billy Mitch, or, uh, Newcastle Army Air Base in the state of Delaware. Mm -hmm. and, uh, state of Delaware, same old, same old. That's where I met my wife. How did you meet your wife? And first of all, what's her name? Her, her maiden name was Patricia Belko. Belko? B-E-L-K-O. Okay. She's probably half Polish and half Russian. Her father was born in southern Russia. Her mother was born in, uh, I think, what was eastern Germany at the time, then became Poland. But, uh, uh -huh. and, and Pat was the youngest of six sisters. I see. How yeah. did you meet uh, Pat? When we flew in to Newcastle Army Air Base, uh, I had to report to the headquarters. And uh, I went into headquarters, and this 18-year-old girl came out. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. And uh, what can I do for you? And I told her, you know, and she walked away, and oh, what a gorgeous body and looks. I go over there again and got acquainted and got, that's, she's the one, that's how it started. Oh boy, oh boy, true story. I don't know, five, six, seven months later, four, three, two, I don't know. I go into the captain's office. I said, Captain, I would like to be shipped to another base. I said, uh, I've met a lovely lady here. And if I stay here, I'm going to get married. And I don't want to get married during a war. I said, that's got to be terrible. He said, well, I'll call you in a day or two. Call me back. He said, Dean, I can send you to Prescott, North Africa, or back to New York Army Air Base. I said, send me to Prescott. So I got to Prescott. And uh, honey, I'll be back, she, you know, and so forth. One day we met in... Boston, halfway each, put the ring on her finger, you know, go back. I'm surprised she did bury the mailman. I wrote so damn many letters, you know. And uh, finally, uh, where'd we get married? Oh, yeah, I got a, a three-day pass, plus Saturday, Sunday, had five days, so took the train down to Wilmington, Delaware, and we got married. We got a $2 marriage license that went down in the, you know, married. We got married there. And we've been now married going on 72 years. Oh, outstanding. We're just now getting to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you were at Prescott, and now you're married. Yeah. So what happens to you and your marriage from here? Uh, what was that? Well, you obviously are still in a service. You're going oh, yeah. to be shipped somewhere else. Yeah. No, I, I was in Prescott. Eventually... Uh, Prescott was like in a country club, and uh, there was a job waiting for Pat, uh, Pat, my wife, Pat. Uh, so she came up. She went to work in the, uh, in the office, and we got a, uh, a one-room apartment about 50 yards from the entrance. So it was a short walk. And, you know, I, was, I didn't have to stay in the, in the barracks. barracks, you know. So that was interesting, uh, getting to know, oh, God. The lady, I forget her name, her husband uh, had uh, all kind of disease up here, you know, and he would go over and turn the water on, put his, and she'd grab him because he's trying to drown himself, see. She had that, her hands full. But we're, we're there one day <clears throat> and looked over at the window and saw this big black head. God damn, that's a bear. We went out and looked. It was a huge dog. He must have weighed 220 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she knew that, you know, <laughs> but that was quite an experience. Uh, then I got the call for overseas, and I could have been scratched off if I wanted to, but I said I wanted to go, see, so 
I went and Pat went back home, you know, and waited uh, till I got out and I got discharged. And where did you go from there then? Uh, from there, uh, went to Cochran Field in California. From there to Okinawa. Where's Cochran Field? Uh, Sausalito is across the Golden Gate Bridge from uh, uh, San Francisco. Okay. It's in that area somewhere. Right. I, I don't remember too much, but uh, yeah. that's where it was. Yeah. And so from the Cochran Field, you go. You were only there a short time. Uh, not long. I think two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. And from there, you go to Okinawa. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get to Okinawa? We got on a uh, C-54 four-engine transport plane, and we flew 1,200 miles, uh, you know. And I'll never forget looking down, and I must, there must have been a naval fleet. There must have been 40 ships, V-shaped, and they, were, they knew something. They were heading somewhere. They were heading to Japan, probably. I don't know. But we got to Okinawa. I mean, we got to Hawaii, then flew to Johnson Island, for refueling. Johnson Island was maybe a half a mile long and a quarter mile wide. But uh, there you could, the Navy was there, you fueled up there, you know. Then we stopped at another little island, then we finally got to Guam. And of course, uh, uh, that's where I uh, called the ho hospital in Guam and asked if I could speak to uh, Sergeant Benny Giacometti. They said he's been discharged. And as I said, uh, I asked a dumb question, where did you send him? Oh, we can't tell you that. Well, I knew they sent him back to Okinawa, and that's how I knew he was there when I got there, you know. But uh, So uh, from uh, Guam, you fly to Okinawa? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you're still in a C-54? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody with you that you knew? Well, some of the... Some of the boys that uh, were in uh, Prescott with me and there's always a handful of them that you know but when I left Wilmington Delaware uh, by myself I went up there I was there's only three of us went that day so it took me a while to get to know some people up there in the Prescott Army Air Base. So where did you land at on Okinawa? Kadena Air Base. Now is that next to Naha? Is that a what? Is that next to the city Naha? What? I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember. Kadena uh, Air Force Base? Yeah. Of course, you read in the paper even today, Kadena Air Base. Yeah. Uh, yeah U.S. Sure. soldiers around there and yeah. whatever. So what were your duties at Kadena? Nothing. Just still waiting for orders. Yeah. Waiting for Did anybody something. ever find out you had three years college yet? I, 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 no. I don't think it would have made any difference. They aren't going to say, oh, you've got three years of college here, put you over there, and it doesn't work that way. You know? Well, they might have put you in OCS. Uh, well, I tried, remember, no birth certificate. No, I didn't, you didn't tell me that. Oh, oh, I, when I got to Fort Hayes, yes, I scored high on the IQ test. Because, hell, I took so many of them in college, I knew right away. If you don't know the answer, skip it, Get you know. I scored, I think, 129 or something, and I qualified, and I went in and applied for officer's candidate school, and I was accepted. But they said, oh, by the way, we, you have to have a birth certificate. Didn't have one. And I told you it took me nine months to get a birth certificate. By then, too late, you know. Mm. Yeah. Changed my whole life uh, when that doctor didn't arrive on time at my birth, you know, right. and forgot to make a birth certificate for me. Changed everything. Maybe I wouldn't be alive today if I'd have been yeah. an officer that would have put me in charge of some infantry and we would hit the beach somewhere. Yeah. But when you're that young, that's what you want to do, you know. Yeah. So you're at Kadena then, and um, is that where you met your brother? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, we landed on uh, Okinawa and we unloaded a lot of uh, sensitive equipment. We didn't know what it was, you know, and uh, oh boy, and while we were there, I'm watching this, they were unloading this airplane, a C-47, and they were they ha were unloading a Jeep. And they got the Jeep on the, you know, long thing to go down, and the ladder broke. 
and that jeep fell on top of a guy who was down below. Mm. You get killed in wars, but it's a shame to get be killed that way, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was on Okinawa a couple of months, I guess, and but long before that, I says, heck, as soon as I get a chance, I'll go for him then. So I went to the first MP station, and I says, where's the 3rd Marine Division, this F, he said, right across the island at Sausalita Air Base, and turn right. I got a hold of a Jeep. No, I hitchhiked over there. That was easy. Got over there, uh, got another little ride, and walked into the Marine Army Air Base, and I told you, I walked in the first sergeant's tent, and they looked up, and they said, you're Big Jack's brother. See, those guys been together three years. They know more about each other than the husbands and wives do, you know. And that's where I met Ben, and Ben was doing what he could do best, sitting down there like this, smoking a cigarette, sitting in an abandoned Japanese, uh, what was that plane, that fighter plane Japan had? A zero? Zero. Uh, they had a zero there, and Ben was sitting in a chair giving orders. And that's when I walked up in front of him, and oh gosh. You know, that's hard to imagine. You know, you're here, he's there. I accompanied him in late December 1941 when he got on a train in Wheeling, West Virginia to go to Quantico. That's the last I saw of him. And, uh, uh, but I, I kept, my mom got a few letters for him because Ben couldn't write, see. And the letter she got, Ben had somebody write for him, you know, I knew that, you know, but that's another story. But, uh, oh, one, I'm at Ben's, uh, I'm at the barracks where Ben was with all these other 18, 19 year old Marines, you know, and everybody yelled, attention, here comes a major coming through for inspection, you know. Everybody stand attention like this with a rifle. And they'd go check this and that, no. Finally, uh, they got down to Ben, where's your rifle, Sergeant? He, ben says, I threw it down in the toilet during the invasion. He just went on. Didn't ask him anything else, see. Yeah. He me to six. So. Yeah, but uh, I heard some great stories over there. Uh, by the way, when I was over there, ran into uh, Jimmy DeBlaze from Bel Air, Hot Dog Roan from Bel Air, uh, Bill Kalashowski from Bel Air, uh, plus my brother, and I made five from that little hometown in Eastern Ohio. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one was in the medical care, and another one was in the, what's the group that goes down and builds airfields? CBs. C another one was in the CBs, and uh, another one, I don't know what he was. I think he was in the artillery, then my brother in the Marine Corps, and there I was. And, and uh, we had a hell of a time with those three cases of beer. As I told you, my brother traded the Jeep for three cases of beer. The Navy guys, you know, they had most everything on board, but they were out in the water a quarter mile or so, but uh, we got those three cases and we had a lot of fun with that. And as we went there, you know, uh, finally the war ended and uh, they're going this way and that way. And finally on December the 9th, I think, they call my name, they get on a plane, they're going home. Got on the plane, there were about 70 guys on there. Uh, we flew to uh, Guam and stopped there. I don't know what we did there, I don't remember. Got back on the plane and it was very quiet. Nobody talked, you know, because some of these poor guys been over there two, three years, you know. They were all dreaming like we were, you know. We fly out, we get out about uh, just short of the point of no return and blew an engine. So we fly and turn back. Mm, I knew something about that, you know. So we go back to Guam, and I don't remember how soon, but uh, we get on the plane again, I think the next day. And we go out about two hours and uh, got an oil leak, splattered oil all over, you know. We turn around and go back. That's when I said, if I get home safely, I'll never fly in an airplane again. I have, but I hate it. I haven't even taken that uh, trip to Washington, D.C., because I don't want to fly on the airplanes. <laughs> um, 
let's go back to when you're on Okinawa, then uh, you're living in the barracks, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and you're there when they dropped the two atomic bombs, August 6th and August 9th of 45. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> did you know about it? No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Did you find out about it after the fact? I suppose so. I, I, I can't really remember, but I suppose I did. Because I always had an ear out for no, for news, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, by the way, I hurt my back again. Well, that's why my back is so bad on Okinawa. Uh, they were, uh, our guys were dynamiting some hard rocks or something, and one of them came through our tent. And uh, our, we had about 14 beds in the tent. I don't remember how many guys were in there, but that rock came in the tent, and... Uh, I fell, I, I fell out of bed some way. Now, I had already hurt my back. Uh, uh, I spent uh, eight days in a hospital in Prescott, Maine with my back. They, they went so far to remove my tonsils because they thought that might be the problem. What did they know about backs in 72 years ago, you know? Uh, so I was, they, you know, do this, what they always do, they put tape all over the back and, you know, and, and uh, I survived and, uh, uh, anyway, as I told you this, or I didn't, when I got back to the States, I had back problems, and I went to see my football coach doctor from the pre-war, Dr. Ed White, and uh, uh, he's checking out my back, and he said, Dean, I know you hurt this back in the military, didn't you? Yes. <coughs> By then, I was 35, 40 years old. <coughs> He said, why don't you go up to the VA hospital and have them look at you and tell them this is military, you know, which I did. And uh, that was interesting. I now get 60% disability for my back and 10% disability for my hearing loss from being in those hangars with the engines roaring on, you know, and yeah. all that, see. Yeah. Uh, they didn't argue about that, but. Uh, um, what did. Uh, <laughs> We left off there, I was going to ask you, what were your feelings about um, us having dropped the two atomic bombs on Japan? Good, the war's over. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's sad, but uh, uh, we knew that if we invaded them, there'd be a million people killed. Yeah. They'd be eight years old shooting at us. Right. You know, we knew that, they knew that, and there was no other choice. Uh, and I'm very glad our president didn't apologize when he went over there. Yeah. Because they never apologized for Pearl Harbor. Yes. As far as I know, anyway. But that, that was sad. The, uh, and you know, when you're a World War II guy or any military guy, you worry about uh, certain people in the Middle East and big countries over there. Uh, I think uh, the atom bomb I heard or read is, 1,000 more powerful than the original atom bomb. So can you imagine? Uh, yeah. Whew. Hello there. How are you? Bye-bye. Going outside. It's, um, it's, I spent a lot of time here doing just that. Not girls, anybody. <laughs> um, well, that seems to be the opinion of most uh, World War II veterans that it was necessary uh, to save lives. You came home then from Okinawa. <clears throat> you flew back and you landed where? From Guam? Cochrane Field. Cochrane Field yeah. again. In Cochrane Field, I'm not sure that's the name, but it was a, a huge air base in Sausalito, California, across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, or reversed. I don't know which right. way. Uh, and your wife, is, Pat, is at her parents' home yes, at this she's, time. She's uh, back home at, with her parents. And, uh, now, are you going to be discharged? Do you know that when you're coming back? Oh, yeah, the war's over, and we knew that, you know, yeah. and uh, got, got there in the uh, San Francisco area, and was there a week or so. They wanted me to send me in the hospital and check out my back and all that. And I want to get home, you know, and, and eventually train down to Marchfield, which is uh, just a little north of L.A. and Hollywood and all those places. And I don't know how many days I was there, but I got on the train. Oh, they gave me a choice. We can fly you to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, which is uh, 
or we can fly you to Wilmington, Delaware, if there's a service there, uh, or we can give you $200 and you can get home yourself. Give me the $200. So I bought a one-way ticket from there uh, to Philadelphia for maybe half of that kind of money or, or even less in those days. So we got on a train, I'll never forget this. We get in, out in Arizona somewhere and a train breaks down. And there was a little railroad station there. <clears throat> we were there nine hours, by the way. The train didn't move for nine hours. So I went in that train station and just like you've seen those pictures, there was an Indian sitting like this with his hat on. You come in, he didn't even move his head, you know. Uh, and I, as I said, I read, I loved history and, ge and geography, you know, like that. But after nine hours, we started moving. I remember stopping in Denver in the middle of the night and it was cold, it was 10 below zero. But uh, then I remember getting to Chicago at six o'clock in the morning and uh, in the airport, or, uh, railroad station, I stretched out on the bench. I was pooped, you know, there's no sleeping. An MP come over with his club. Soldier, you can't sleep there. I, I didn't say it, but I said, geez, Grammy, the war's over and this happens. So I got to Philadelphia, then I got to Wilmington, Delaware, and I got off. And I'm sitting there after I got off in the station. I said, what the hell do I do now? I don't have a job. I don't have a college degree. I don't have any clothing. I don't have any place to live. Uh, but I got a wife. So I got on the bus and went up to Broom Street. And there was my wife, you know. And I stayed, we stayed with them there, uh, my wife and I, for maybe two months. Then the light went off up here. Dean, you ought to go back to college and get your degree. Uh, but I, I had a job in Wilmington, Delaware. Hell, I had a job two weeks after I got out of service. That was easy. Uh, it wasn't something I liked to do, but it was a job. In those days, after World War II, you could get $25 a week for one year while you're unemployed. I think I, I took two weeks of that and went to work. A lot of guys just didn't go to work. $25 a week, you know, if you're Not single, you know, yeah. so on. But I came uh, to UC and uh, fortunately uh, uh, the little cafe across the street from the university and Joe Graham, about five foot three and weighed about 300 pounds. Oh, dear, 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 blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm married, Joe, and I'm looking for an apartment. And Billy, Johnny Williams was sitting around there. Dean, we got one across the street. Oh boy, we got a one room apartment on the edge of the campus, the street on the edge of the campus, and it was an experience, but it was close to UC. And my wife went to work and I went to school. Where'd she go to work at? Oh, on a campus. Oh, on yeah. Campus. She started working in the football ticket office, say, uh, athletics, me, you know, ticket office. Then she got a better job over there, you know, and uh, she worked there uh, until we had our children, our twins, and, uh, Boy, I go to school 12 months, and I had a job on a campus. I worked at night on a campus. Uh, at the main entrance, uh, I worked there. They had to show me their pass to get in, you know, and ask questions and stuff like that. So I worked at night, and uh, Pat worked at the day, and I went to school all day, you know. Now, you, uh, and you graduated when? Uh, 1947, 19... instead of 1943. Right, 1947. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um... Do you have any children when you graduate from college? No. No. Came soon after. So after you graduate, what do you do for a living now? First of all, as I told you, my wife never wanted to stay in Cincinnati, neither did I. I love my hometown. She missed her family, five sisters and all that. We, we said, we'll never stay here. So I get my degree, and I'm sitting right outside of the the Annie Laws Auditorium on one of those concrete benches. I said, Dean, what the hell are you going to do now? You don't have any money. Uh, you got to do something. So the light went off, 
when I was thinking, and uh, Bill Gleason was coming up, and he yelled, uh, hey, Joe, I got a call from one of the board members last night. There's a job opening for a football coach uh, and a history teacher at Walton Hills High School. And he yelled, I can't go because I, don't, I'm, I haven't graduated yet. And the other guy says, well, all I have is a physical education member, mem you know, a physical education degree. Huh, maybe I'll go down. Yes, I went down and applied for the job. And uh, uh, whether Coach Marr, <clears throat> who was a Catholic, and there was one Catholic on the Board of Education, in those days, Catholics were not too welcome anywhere, you know. I told Coach Meyer, if you can help me, call. I don't know whether they did or not, but I eventually got the job. <clears throat> and went to Walnut Hills High School as a football coach, assistant coach, and uh, social studies teacher. Politics, politics, and after the school was over, I got a call from the principal, and oh no, I got a letter from the Board of Education. We can no longer continue your duties as teacher, coach, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, they didn't say why or anything, you know. Uh, but, gee, I mentioned this to a couple of guys, and one of the parents heard about it, and he called the principal and called downtown. Next thing you know, they called me in, and the principal says, Mr. Giacometti, it was all my fault. Uh, that this happened, and that was hard back, see, so. But I knew what happened. When you have a name like Giacometti, I can tell you a better story, see, because I know what's going on. I knew, I grew up listening to that stuff, you know. But I, I uh, uh, stayed there, you know, uh, and uh, coached football and taught for 19 years there. I taught with four head coaches. Four different guys. I was always the number one assistant, you know. And it isn't true that when people ask me, what was your toughest job coaching at Walnut Hills High School? I'd say coaching the assistant coaches. Well, I didn't really say that. You follow me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Finally, the fourth one was so <laughs> bad, I was embarrassed and I, re I, I retired from coaching, you know. I did coach uh, a minor league professional football team with a guy that came down from Pittsburgh and said, uh, there's going to be a professional team in this city, uh, and uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. So I coached there with Ray Nolting, the University of Cincinnati football coach. Yeah. He and I coached uh, that minor league team, but that lasted a, a year, that's all, and that fizzled out. What know. was the name of that team, do you recall? Uh, boy, oh boy. It wasn't, mm, mm, same name, oh, Titans, no. Uh, God darn, I can't think of it now. Okay. I can't think of it. Uh, one day we had like about 100 guys out there trying out for the team. They heard, rumor got around that they were going to get $50 a game, and I thought that too. And some of them were going to get more than that, see? Uh, and... Uh, I'll never forget the night when we were supposed to cut the team down to 33 players. Ray and Ole, the head coach, didn't show up. So I did it. I never was called mother something so many times in my <laughs> life and got it down to 32, you know, 33 players. And uh, we were doing pretty good, and, uh, but uh, I could see this was, wasn't going to work. But uh, anyway... So that uh, was the end of that team, huh? Yes. Uh, th they had a team again next year, but they were, they were just playing semi-pro stuff, you know. And, uh, now you, uh, somewhere along the line, you mentioned that you had twins. Oh, yes. Uh, we had a night game when, when I was at Walnut Hills, and uh, my wife was at the game that night, and uh, I think we lost anyway. We lived close to the campus, I told you, and Harry Hannum, who later became a head coach with me, and he was a teammate of mine at UC. We went up to a local restaurant, just discussed things, and Pat was with us, my wife. 
And uh, she wasn't saying much. And finally she said, Dean, I've got so much pain in my stomach. Uh, let's go home, you know, let's go home. So we went home and make it quick. By seven o'clock next morning, I was the father of twin girls. But uh, we get home and uh, she gets in bed and she was in misery. Mike Gretchen lived upstairs and he had a car. And as Pat got dressed and I called Mike. Mike took us over to Christ Hospital. Pat went in the hospital there, you know. I stayed there all night. And uh, about an hour after she was in there, a nurse came over and said, you're the father of twins. Oh my God, I didn't dream. Pat didn't even look pregnant, you know. It was six months and 10 days. And I still call my daughter, who's now 67 years old, a miracle child. Uh, the, the larger the two, two pound, two ounces, she died uh, 24 hours later. One of the nurses took her out of the incubator. See, they didn't have automatic heated incubators in those right. days. And uh, preemies, you can't do that, see. And she admitted she did it, and she, re she left, uh, she quit nursing, you know. Boy, two people from out of town, no family, you've got a death in the family, what do you do, you know? What do you do? Well, my best buddy was Bob Meyer, Hughes High School. He knew we didn't have any money, and, and uh, uh, the twin is buried on top of uh, his mother's grave in the cemetery across this, uh, the biggest cemetery in the city in the middle, I forget the name Spring of it. Spring Grove. No, no, right. it's just off of Vine Street. Vine Street Cemetery. That's what it is, yeah. I guess, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that twin is buried there. Valerie weighed a pound and nine ounces. I couldn't believe that. Pound and nine ounces. Well, we didn't get her home for about four months. When she came home, she weighed four and a half pounds. And uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield was only good for three weeks. And we had her home five days, something was wrong. They took her and she had to go to Children's Hospital. She was there maybe six weeks. And uh, what happened was she caught diarrhea. And for preemies, diarrhea is, yes. oh God. So when she got over there, and to this day, she has keloid skin like I do. It leaves a lump, you know. Uh, but I could see where they had needles uh, feeding her, see, you know. But it doesn't show anything on her face or anything. Uh, but uh, uh, finally we got her home. Uh, that, she was born 1948, October uh, 9th, 1948. And uh, we got her home and said, well, we got to get out of this apartment, get some room, you know. We got an apartment on Vine Street, right where the cemetery is one room apartment, real apartment. I heard a knock on another door one night and it was a neighbor. Quit making so much noise, keep that child quiet. Oh boy. I went over that door and I yelled something, no obscenity or anything, see. Well, we were trying, we tried to get out of there soon. Got another apartment over in uh, South Norwood. Uh, second floor, big, nice, we go over there. Uh, we're, we're there three, four months. The uh, owner come up and says, well, my, my daughter's gonna move in the, the upper floor. You're gonna have to move out, see? Oh, look around, find an apartment. First floor of a two, four home over in uh, uh, Vine, uh, Walnut Hills area. Uh, what's that street that Priscilla High School's on? Not Montgomery Road. Uh, it, well, anyway, that, we were over there. What's that? The fourth apartment, you know. See, that's the way it was. Uh, if you had a child, forget it. You know, that would made it difficult. But by that time, uh, working uh, three jobs, uh, I saved enough money, and we bought a house in Pleasant Ridge. Uh, house cost uh, $13,000, and 16 years later, we sold it for... Ten thousand dollars. 
<laughs> but we did get a house and that was a lot better, you know. And Valerie, when she started first grade, she was the tiniest kid in the first grade. And some of those big girls would carry her like she was a baby doll, you know. And uh, I talked with her doctor, who was a good friend of uh, me later in life, because his sister and I went to UC together. And I said, Dr. Ryan, uh, do you think I ought to hold Valerie back a year because of her size and premature and whatever? He said, oh no, he says she's a bright child, see. Uh, so she started with, with the same class, you know, and mm -hmm. some of those big girls would pick her up, you know, like she was a doll. But uh, Valerie uh, uh, made it, she did well. She got to UC and got her college degree over there and uh, met her husband over there. He is an engineer. He graduated from UC's engineering college and he is from Eastern Pennsylvania. And they live in upstate New York now. And Valerie, uh, the uh, miracle child, had, uh, uh, she has two daughters. Oh, good. And uh, one is, and she has two grandchildren. And one time they came to visit us and they called us from uh, Kennedy Heights. Uh, the car broke down. Well, I got there immediately. They were there, police stopped, and told him what happened. He said, get in the car, I'll take you to my house, you know. He says, you know, you're in a dangerous neighborhood. This was 50, 60 years ago. Danger, Kennedy Heights, dangerous, 60 years ago. Wow. Anyway, uh, we got to our place, and uh, while Valerie was down here, she had a miscarriage. She was at the Bethesda Hospital over here. Uh, she woke up bleeding, you know, as they do, and uh, she had the miscarriage down here. Okay, and and then they went <clears throat> back up, and she had the two girls up there, you know, and and uh, they love it up there. What's your grandchildren's names? <clears throat> uh, Molly, and uh, oh gosh, oh boy, Molly lives on Long Island. She has two children. Kate lives, uh, uh, she isn't married, but Kate bought a condo and she got a great job. She's a welder. She went to welding school, you know. Girls are doing that now. <clears throat> the teacher hired her for the job. Is she making money? Yeah. Oh, gosh, thanks. And he treats her like his own daughter, you know. In fact, uh, he was, uh, had a couple of his workers go over to help uh, Kate uh, repair some things around the house and dig a garden for her, see? But uh, that's what they're doing, yeah. Uh, oh, they both uh, went to college at uh, in upstate New York, a, a very special college, uh, a girls only college. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name right yeah. now, but. Uh, now your wife, her health is good? Uh, yes, right now, uh, if she was 20 years, 10 years younger, that uh, give her, uh, repair her uh, knee. Uh, she needs knee surgery. But uh, Pat is 92 and she looks 75. Really, I'm not uh, bragging, she uh, does. Uh, and the doctor says, at your age, there's too many things could go wrong. So she does have some trouble with that uh, uh, right knee. Got it. Got it. But, uh, intelligent doctor, that's, he's made a good, wise choice, it sounds like. At this point in the uh, interview, i like to ask Brian uh, what questions he has. Uh, Brian? Uh, I just have a few questions. Uh, I was, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when you were in Okinawa, did you have much encounters with the natives on the island? No. No, we were afraid of them. You know, you might walk up and talk to them and they might have a bomb here and throw it at you, see? We were told that. And there were a lot of those caves around there, you know. Uh, and of course, uh, those caves, uh, our guys threw a, a hand grenade in there, but there were still some living in there, you know. But no, uh, saw very few, but I saw a lot of Japanese prisoners. Yeah, I was gonna ask, what, where did you see them? What were they doing with the prisoners there? Do you remember? Oh, there was a big uh, wire fence uh, and uh, in there, there, there must have been 150 Japanese prisoners in there. And I saw some of them that were six foot tall. In my history and geography, I knew they come from Hokkaido. That's the northernmost island in Japan. The guys up there are pretty big. But uh, yes, and 
I didn't see them, but some of my group went to Japan and they helped pick up the, our prisoners of war up there. And they flew to uh, uh, Okinawa, fueled, and I knew they were on this plane, but I never saw them, you know. And uh, by the way, uh, Billy Respol lived three doors from me. He was on Corregidor. He survived the Bataan Death March. And worse than that, he survived that bus trip to Japan down in a hold where they were defecating, on, you know, nothing else they could do. And when he got to Japan, they put him in the mine and he'd work in that mine maybe six weeks or two months. Then they would bring him up for, I don't know, a couple hours. He survived. And I remember going back home and he was there, you know. What was his name again? Uh, Billy uh, Respol, R-E-S. P-O-L-E, Billy Respol. And how did you know him? Well, he lived on my street back in Bel Air, four or five, three, four doors up the road. We were going home from school one day. He was a year behind, but we were walking home. And he says, oh, see that box of matches over there in the curb? He says, if there's a match in there, I'm going to join the Army. There was a match in there. He joined the Army. But he was going to join the Army anyway. Right. Bill was kind of a loner, you know. There, he had five brothers and two sisters, and uh, he, uh, he never played on our baseball teams, but, uh, but he was a great guy. But how he survived that, I'll never know. How did he get captured? Can you Pardon? Do you know how he got captured? <clears throat> he was on the Baton Death March uh, right, okay. with all those guys. He saw them get clubbed in the head, getting shot and everything, and I knew, I knew he was on the Corregidor, you know, and that's how it happened. But, uh, Did you uh, see him after the war? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Washington Street, where I lived, about 25 years ago, had a street party reunion every year. And guys would come from out of town, and I went up a couple of times. They asked me to be the speaker or whatever, and Billy was usually there. He didn't say much, but he was there. So I saw him once a year for about 10 years anyway. But, you know, he, so he moved back to your hometown? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Any idea what he ended up doing? Did he... Uh, Never went to work, no. Uh -uh. He probably got a 100% disability, I'm sure of that. And he had uh, two or three brothers uh, and a couple of sisters. And I wonder if they took care of him or just took his check money. I don't know. It could, could have happened, you know. But uh, when you talk to Billy, his eyes would go like this. You could tell that, uh, you know, gee whiz, just think of all those other prisoners. Oh, my. Yeah. You talk about heroes, those guys that, oh, boy, oh, boy, what they did. Yeah. Mm. Did your brother continue to stay in the Marines, or what did he do after the Oh, war? no, Ben couldn't wait to get out. Ben couldn't wait to get back home. Uh, he, he's, he, if you offered Ben a um, uh, million dollar house in California, he wouldn't go. Neither would I. We loved our hometown. I don't know why. I don't know why. No, Ben went right back home and went right back to his same job in the steel mill across the river. And Ben was known, or they said he was the strongest man in the mill and in Bel Air, Ohio. Uh, he was a pretty big guy. But he was not a, 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 an aggressive guy. He was a nice guy, you know, comedian pretty much. But uh, what was the name of the steel mill? Wheeling Benwood Wheeling Steel. That's it. Wheeling Steel. It's no longer in existence. Right. My dad worked there 25 years, and Ben worked there until uh, uh, he passed away. Uh, no, not till he passed away. Uh, ben was 60, 74. This is interesting. My dad died at age 74. My mother died at age 74. My brother Ben died at age 74. Can you imagine that? Just yeah. a coincidence, you know? So what did you do when you turned 74? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. I went to their funerals. No, when you <laughs> turned 74. Oh, I don't know. Did, I can't. You, did you try to eat a little better or something? Well, I, I, I probably did. You probably stayed in the house all day. I might have. <laughs> I might have done that. I don't remember. I might have had a few drinks that night. I don't know. But, uh, oh, gosh sakes. Uh, when, when we've uh, 
talk to other guys who want to open odd weather. Sometimes they, they just talked about how they were in the middle of typhoons. Did you run into any kind of bad weather? Uh, I got out just in time. Uh, two days after we left, they had a hell of a typhoon. Some of those Navy ships that were a half mile out were washed up on the shore in Okinawa. Now, my brother was there when they had one, but it wasn't that big. But Ben was there when they had this big one that I missed because uh, he hadn't been sent home yet. But uh, I, I was curious, uh, could you give us just a, a brief thing about your brother's career? Where, where did he serve as a Marine during World War II? Do you know much about his service? Uh, not a whole lot because he didn't write, but he was over there three years in the 3rd Marine Division. I know he was in a lot of uh, uh, invasions because uh, uh, he would mention that uh, a little island over there, and Ben never had that kind of knowledge of geography. Uh, I heard him mention, well, I can't think of him right now, but he got the purple, well, I told you he got a purple heart, you know. But uh, he was in a, a few invasions over there, I know that. Third, uh, if I remember correctly, Third Division was on Iwo Jima also. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. A, a, and, uh, a pilot, a, probably knew it then, but I don't know it now. Yeah, but uh, well, uh, when you were uh, when you were over there, what was your wife doing? Uh, doing uh, while you were overseas? Pat was working. Yeah, she was in working her uh, in her hometown. Yeah, she was working uh, uh, with a telephone company, which she did before she took her job on the air base. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, you guys were both. You were saying that both of you didn't want to stay in Cincinnati, but obviously you have. Was there a was there a uh, a time that you guys felt like you were going to stay in Cincinnati? Was oh yes. After the daughter uh, Valerie survived and got to be two, three years, I had a chance to join my buddy Nick Scorch. He had a job for me, assistant football coach of the college in upstate New York. Uh, I, I couldn't go. I didn't want to take Valerie in a strange part of the country, you know, because she needed a lot of medical attention, you know. So that's when we knew we were doomed to stay here. I had a lot of job offers to go, but uh, I couldn't take them. Uh, later, when, you know, when we're here 10, 12 years, let's stick it out for 30, which I did, you know. Oh, come on in. Hey, I'll hold that door. Yes. Uh, Yeah, when Nick was head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, Pat and I would go up to Hershey, Pennsylvania every year. That's where they had their practice, you know. And we'd spend three, four days there, and that was, and that was great. That was fun. Then when he got the head coach at Cleveland Browns, we'd go up there. I had a sideline pass for all the games. And uh, people thought, who in the hell is that guy, you know? <laughs> you remember uh, Sheriff Tehan? Sure. Yeah, Dan T. Yeah. Knew him well, see. And, and I'm up there one day, and I'm on the sideline watching the game. They're playing the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, T. Han was five yard, 10 yards from me, you know. And the uh, Eagles had a tall guy was a uh, safety man. I forget his name, but he's tall and skinny. And I heard him say, uh, I'm going to turn you into the... Uh, office, the NFL office, and T. Han said, this is a bad word, he said it would take a blank like you to do it, <laughs> SOB is what yeah. he said, it would take an SOB like you to do it, you know, <laughs> oh boy, I heard more things that those pro football players say when they were taken out of the game, you know, <laughs> God, 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 and all that kind of stuff, but uh, no, we knew that the time had come, we had to stay, and uh, but we made a lot of trips home every Christmas, Delaware, Eastern Bel Air. We'd go to Bel Air on three day weekends. And one time uh, it snowed so bad uh, at my hometown when we were up there uh, that you couldn't get, leave. So I said, Pat, why don't you and Valerie go home to Wilmington, Delaware? Uh, this was Thanksgiving weekend and uh, come back at Christmas time. Uh, so that's what she did. She and Val went down there till Christmas, and uh, then they came back to Cincinnati. And I, I had another apartment I didn't mention. Uh, we had a beautiful second floor 
you know where the chili parlor is at Ludlow and mm, yes, uh, about cool. a block or two past that, close to a funeral home. It was great, second floor, but same story. Uh, well, our children, no, the building was sold and we had to get out, you know, and that, that was a tough one, but. Uh, I got one last question. Uh, so after you re uh, retired from coaching, what did you, what did you do? Uh, well, I stayed at Walnut Hills for another four or five years, you know, and uh, I was getting tired of this, you know. So by this time, I had some connections, although I wasn't born and raised in this town. And Hugo always said to me, why don't you get the hell out of there and I'll get you a job downtown in the office, you know. And I waited. Finally, that day came, you know. He had a connection down there. Hugo. Hugo, you know. Uh, his brother was a friend of mine. He, his brother was a football, NFL football official. But anyway, uh, what the hell was I saying there? He had a job for you downtown. Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, I had this job downtown. And you're normally, you know, uh, it's a, you, ha you have a hell of a time getting a job downtown if you weren't on the if bowling team or you weren't from Cincinnati and if you were Catholic that didn't help. See, I knew all that. But uh, uh, I went down there and took the job in the business office. And the superintendent was in charge of it was a mason. That didn't surprise me but no difference, you know. But uh, he took me because he thought that my buddy was going to do him some good because he was a uh, buddy with uh, Governor, Governor Lausch. Lausch, yeah. Yeah, remember that? Sure. Yeah. So I stayed down there for 18 years. Now you say downtown. What do you mean by downtown? Well, uh, the, that, what uh, the Board of Education was on East 9th Street. Okay. But my office, uh, we, were, we were on, uh, uh, gee whiz, we were uh, away from downtown. Uh, we were a block from Reading Road in, I can't remember the side street. It was only a, a, a block from, uh, uh, what's the word, that runs from... U Eggleston? Uh, no, that runs from uh, University of Cincinnati to People's Corner. Uh, University of Cincinnati, that's McMillan. Yeah, we were just a block down from McMillan. Okay. That was a school building at one time, but that's where the business office okay. was. And uh, that's where my office uh, was. Yeah. Well, I just uh, I got one last question. Did you use the GI Bill after you got out of the Oh, building? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, use it at UC and uh, at Xavier. That's how I got a degree at Xavier because I had the bill, you know. And, and, and that Xavier was close to Walton Hills, so I could get over there, as I told you, uh, Wednesday afternoons and early evening. And all day Saturday, in two years, I got a, a degree, master's degree over there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Well, Dean Giacometti. You got it right. Thank you so much for this interview, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, you for saying that, but uh, God bless you. <laughs>